Today, the Senate held its first formal hearing on the security failure surrounding the insurrection on January the 6th. The former Capitol Police Chief, the former House and Senate Sergeant at Arms, a Capitol Police Captain, and the acting D.C. Chief of Police all testified today. They talked about what they saw on January 6th and where they think things went horribly wrong. In case you missed it, here's what happened in the hearing today in two minutes. Of the multitude of events I've worked in my nearly 19 year career in the department, this was by far the worst of the worst. I was surprised at the reluctance to immediately send the National Guard to the Capitol grounds. As recent as Tuesday, January 5th, during a meeting I hosted with my executive team, the Capitol Police Board, and a dozen of the top law enforcement and military officials from D.C., no entity, including the FBI, provided any new intelligence regarding January 6th. We properly planned for a mass demonstration with possible violence. What we got was a military-style coordinated assault on my officers and a violent takeover of the Capitol building. When a critical intelligence report is received by the Capitol Police uh, from an intelligence community source like the FBI, um, who usually would receive it? And I guess I'll start with, did you receive this report? Thank you very much for the question, ma'am. Uh, I actually just in the last 24 hours uh, was uh, informed by the department that they actually had received that report. Okay, and Mr. Irving, Mr. Stanger, do you, did you get that report? Beforehand, Mr. Stanger, did you get the report? No. Okay, no. Mr. Irving. I, I did not. Chief Sun was on the call, uh, literally pleading uh, for, there were several Army officials that were on the call. I don't know all by name who were on the call. Uh, several officials from district government that were on the scene. Was, Chief Sun was pleading uh, for the deployment of the National Guard. I was just stunned uh, that, you know, I have officers that were out there literally fighting for their lives. And, you know, we're, we're kind of going through, you know, what seemed like a, an exercise to really check the boxes. Do you think this was an intelligence breakdown or a resource issue? I think that the intelligence uh, is not, did not make it where it needed uh, to be. The hearing today will be the first of many about the Capitol violence. Next week, Congress will hear from the Defense Department, Homeland Security, and the FBI. The clock is ticking for lawmakers to figure out what went horribly wrong before we reach the next red letter dates on the calendar. Security experts are warning that QAnon supporters may gather in D.C. on March the 4th, the day when followers of Q believe Donald Trump will be sworn in as the, quote, true president of the United States. And in Michigan, two people were just arrested for threatening public officials, including Senator Debbie Stabenow, leading up to and following the election which means we are a month and a half from one of the ugliest, scariest days for American democracy, and we are still nowhere close to out of the woods yet. Starting us off tonight are Clint Watts, former special agent at the FBI, and Malcolm Nance, a former U.S. intelligence officer and an expert in counterterrorism. So basically the people I call in an emergency. You two. Uh, Malcolm, what information did you learn from today's hearing, if anything? I was quite stunned at some of the testimony, and there are two things that I thought were, were most important that stood out to me. First, that Chief Sund immediately called this mainly a failure of intelligence, not a failure on the part of the Capitol Hill police of buffing up their resources. Uh, I was really shocked by that because the intelligence was there, but it was there to the average, even casual viewer. Uh, and I know Clint will attest to this, too. I was watching over the entire month of December as the Stop the Steal rally was being organized. It was also informally known as Fight for Trump and Storm the Hill. And you could even buy T-shirts online saying that's what they were going there to do. These people were coordinating a week in advance about bring your body armor, bring pepper spray, things that I thought the park police wouldn't even allow them onto the mall with. They were not only allowed onto the mall, they brought that up to the Capitol, arm, put their gear on, and went up and did battle. That was number one. And number two was when uh, Captain Mendoza said that she was sprayed with CS tear gas, which is a, which is a military-grade gas. Uh, they might have had that in the Capitol Hill police arsenal. If they didn't, I'm pretty sure I know where it came from. We have identified at least three photographs where protesters had st stolen 
real cases of Washington, D.C. police forces, um, riot gear, riot guns, and possibly the riot launchers themselves. So they stole this stuff, just wheeled it out. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was just a, a, a really horrific day, but the blitheness of some of the comments by the chief and you know, the, the blindness that the sergeant of arms had was all shocking. That was shocking to me too, Clint, because, you know, we all watch it on television. So I, I just want to sort of mm. set the stage here. There is no mystery surrounding who these people supported, <laughs> why they were in Washington, D.C. I mean, I, I don't want to pretend as if those questions have not been answered by watching it on live television where people left the rally where Trump spoke and then carried flags with his name on it to the Capitol as he instructed them to do. Um, so, so with that aside, where did the breakdown happen? As Malcolm said, all of that planning was happening on Instagram. It's not the dark web. It wasn't like it was hard to find. If, if you guys knew, why didn't the FBI and the Capitol Police coordinate better? I think there's a couple things to look at. One, in terms of the FBI and the position they're in, they're not really the domestic uh, warning system that you would normally look at. That's intelligence fusion centers. It comes through either the JTDFs if it's a terrorism case. Mm -hmm. Remember, we don't have a domestic terrorism law or domestic terrorism designation process. So you can't have a nationwide domestic terrorism case open on a lot of the individuals that are there. It's ones and twos that they're trying to investigate in different ways. That leaves DHS. Well, we know from the year before, DHS was trying to overhype the Antifa threat while suppressing white supremacy, while suppressing malicious, right? So there's a breakdown in that. That information obviously is not flowing in. The third thing is it's the capital region. The capital region is not, as we heard there in the testimony today, like a normal state. A normal state, a, a city or a mayor, they would go to the governor, the governor would authorize the use of the National Guard, and it all happens very quickly. This falls to the Department of the Defense. And who is the SecDef then? Someone who had been there for three weeks. He, he wasn't even there a whole month, okay. right? He's trying to deal with the situation. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to provide cover for him, but remember in the last summer, he was trying to probably react to what he saw with General Milley and Secretary Asper when they were at the George Floyd protest and were used essentially as pawns. And let's add to that, part of this conspiracy was that the military was going to come and declare martial law to renew Donald Trump as the president. And so I'm sure this connected mm. with the calculus, whether it's the FBI, the DHS, mm. the DC mm. Metropolitan Police, or the DOD, they all were politicized by Trump and left them in a state of paralysis right. that led to this on this day. Mm -hmm. So that is very concerning, but it helps, I hope folks understand that, you know, there are real consequences in terms of when you have staff level folks leaving the administration or being pushed aside or marginalized um, by the Trump administration that was putting uh, folks in, as Clint said, um, who were focused on a, a threat by Antifa as opposed to the threat of white nationalists. In terms of where we are now, though, Malcolm, with the threats um, out there, um, you know, being surrounding the day uh, of March the 4th, where do things stand now? We have a new president, which means we have a new administration. We have new people in these agencies. But yet a lot of those staff level positions may not be, um, oh, I mean, the, the staffing might not be as robust given how many of these agencies were gutted during the last administration. So is the Biden administration ready to handle these types of threats um, potentially on as soon as March 4th? Well, we certainly are now. And let's juxtapose this with the last month of the Trump administration. You know, one of the reasons that they managed to get up to the Capitol and do battle and move on, and to be quite honest, was the fact that they used their skin color and who they voted for as a form of camouflage to close on their enemies. And people thought, well, these are Trump voters. They're not going to do anything. And these people literally brought body armor, load-bearing equipment, uh, you know, helmets, uh, munitions and pepper sprays to do battle. They used Trump flags and American flags as spears, and they beat officers uh, almost to death. 
On the other hand, once that administration transitioned out, and oh, by the way, the entirety of the Trump national security apparatus neutralized itself too by assuming these people were gonna be nice. The new administration and the bureaucrats who are in these organizations are now aware that there is a national security threat. They're not going to allow this to happen ever again. Uh, you know, I, I watch on the forums today, they're all still complaining that there are National Guard troops around the Capitol. Why are they there? They're there for you. And I mean, they are there literally every five meters, uh, every 15 feet, there is an armed soldier. So that is never going to happen twice. And come March 4th, I don't think it's going to manifest itself. I don't think anyone's going to come to it. I think they're going to sit and whine and wonder why Trump's not the 19th inaugurated president of the United States. Well, I hope that you're right, Malcolm, but we will pay close attention and we'll have both of you back as uh, we continue to follow this story because obviously these QAnon people aren't going anywhere. They're still here. They still believe this stuff. Uh, and so I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to always um, have this conversation so we understand how to combat certain threats as they come up. Clint Watts and Malcolm Nance, thank you so much for being here and please stay safe. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.